welcome everybody uh, for our Supreme Court uh, preview. Uh, I'm Lee Liberman Otis. I am the Senior Vice President of the Federalist Society along with my colleague, Dean Reuter, and uh, the Director of our Faculty Division, which is co-sponsoring this event with our practice groups. Uh, I am, uh, we're going to get started because uh, there are one or two things to talk about. Um, and uh, so I'm going to invite my colleague, Dean, to come uh, join us, join me, and he will uh, introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much, Lee. It, it is a, a privilege and honor to be before you all here today. I want to thank you all for coming out on a rainy day on a typically snow, slow uh, news day in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's also my privilege to introduce today's opening speaker, the Honorable Noel Francisco, the Solicitor General of the United States. Uh, Noel will speak for a few minutes, maybe 10 to 12 minutes, he tells us, uh, and then our panel's going to ensue immediately on the heels of those opening remarks. Uh, and I do want to thank our panelists in advance and our moderator, Pete Williams. Noel Francisco received his undergraduate degree with honors from the University of Chicago and his JD with high honors uh, from the Chicago Law School, after which he served as a clerk for Judge Ludig on the Fourth Circuit and then Justice Scalia on the U.S. Supreme Court. He continued his career in the Washington firm Cooper Carvin, now something else, uh, now known as Cooper Kirk. Uh, in 2001, he was appointed as associate counsel to President Bush after which he served in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice from 2003 to 2005. In 2005, he left the public sector to join Jones Day, the Washington, D.C. law firm, um, where he was a Supreme Court litigator, arguing cases including McDonald versus United States, the Zubik versus Burwell, and the Noel Canning case. He left Jones Day when President Trump appointed him to the position of Principal Deputy Solicitor General effective January 23rd of last year. On March 10th, he was nominated to be Solicitor General and confirmed a year ago in September, uh, and just in time for the 2017-2018 term. With that, please join me in welcoming U.S. Solicitor General Noel Francisco. Thanks, Dean, for that introduction, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you all today. It is always great to get together with so many friends at the Federal Society and uh, followers of the Supreme Court. This is a time of transition for the Supreme Court, and also for a Federal Society member who has served the President and our nation with distinction for these past 18 months, the White House Counsel and my friend and former law partner, Don McGahn. Uh, people sometimes, when I speak to younger law students and college students, they ask me for career advice. And I never really have any particularly good advice to give. But I can tell you that the single best thing I ever did in terms of my career was recruit Don McGann to be a partner at Jones Day. And uh, it was fantastic to practice law with him then, and it is fantastic to practice law with him now. When his uh, forthcoming departure was announced, Senate Majority Leader Mitch, McCon Mitch McConnell said, and I'm quoting, Don is the most impressive White House counsel during my time in Washington, and I've known them all. I haven't known quite as many uh, White House counsels as the leader has, but I can echo his admiration for Don's judgment, his leadership, and his character. He will be deeply missed, and I think this country owes him a great debt of gratitude for the service that he has rendered. The Supreme Court's past term uh, was my first as Solicitor General, and it was a blockbuster. Just to summarize a few of the key cases for those who want to get caught up on last season, among the many important decisions that the court issued was uh, one upholding the president's travel executive order, one overruling a 40-year-old precedent to hold that mandatory public sector agency, fee, agency fees unlawfully compelled public employee speech, one vacating Colorado's application of its public accommodations law to a Christian baker who declined to make a cake for a same-sex wedding, 
one that struck down two California disclosure requirements regulating pro-life pregnancy centers, uh, one that struck down a federal law regulating sports gambling, which interestingly was argued on both sides by uh, uh, two of the most august members of this organization, and one that held that the government has to obtain a warrant in order to obtain cell site records. Uh, I've said this before and I'll say it again, I think it is one of the most consequential Supreme Court terms in recent history and it is going to be hard to top that one in years to come. Looking ahead to this term, I'm not sure that we quite yet have the number of blockbuster cases that we had last year, but I think it also promises to be fascinating in, uh, in perhaps different ways. For the first time in 30 years and the first time in my professional career, Justice Anthony Kennedy will not be on the court. Justice Kennedy was, of course, the focus of much of the briefing and argument in recent years, particularly in the decade after Justice O'Connor left the court. He was a great defender of First Amendment freedoms who also will be deeply missed, but it will be very interesting to see how the court changes, how it changes at our oral argument, how it changes in its decisions, and how it changes perhaps in many, many other significant ways now that we no longer will have a Justice Kennedy on the court. Uh, so I think that uh, that is one of the most interesting things we're going to see, but it's also going to be interesting to see how they resolve the cases they've already granted and what's left to come. As I said, the docket thus far doesn't currently have the blockbuster cases uh, uh, before the court, but there are several big cases in the pipeline, and I'm going to talk about those very briefly in a couple of minutes. But in terms of the current cases, I think one early theme that we see is the court's willingness to revisit precedent in some important areas of law. First up in the dock is a case called Nick against Township of Scott, where the court is considering the, or reconsidering the so-called Williamson County rule. That's a rule that essentially requires property owners challenging municipal laws under the takings clause to proceed in state court rather than federal court. Interestingly, this case involves Pennsylvania cemetery law and whether the rural township of Scott, Pennsylvania can force a property owner to allow the public to visit an old family cemetery that's located on her farm. And the court specifically granted this case to reconsider the old Williamson County rule. That rule has been the subject of much criticism with Justice Thomas recently uh, lamenting how in his view it quote, downgraded the protection afforded by the takings clause to second class status, end quote. Uh, this argument is set for the first Wednesday of the term. I'm gonna argue it, so it'll be my first argument of the term. And so let's stay tuned to see if Williamson County ends up in the graveyard. <laughs> but I'm bummed. The second doctrine that the court has agreed to reconsider is the so-called dual sovereignty ex exception to the double jeopardy clause of the Fifth Amendment. The dual sovereignty doctrine states that because the federal government and the states are separate sovereigns, the Constitution does not prohibit successive prosecutions by these sovereigns, even for the same offense. A couple of years ago, Justices Ginsburg and Thomas, a somewhat odd couple, suggested that the dual sovereignty doctrine bears fresh examination in an appropriate case. And it appears that the court is now ready to give that doctrine fresh examination in a case called Gamble against United States. But those aren't the only two cases where the court has taken a look at some old doctrines. It's also agreed for the second time now to reconsider a precedent involving the scope of state sovereign immunity. In 1979, in a case called Nevada against Hall, the court held that states don't have sovereign immunity in the courts of other states. So that means that a state can be hailed into the courts of another state against its will. Three years ago, the court granted certiorari in a case called Franchise Tax Board of California against Hyatt. Uh, and that was Hyatt, the Hyatt case's second trip to the Supreme Court to reconsider this Hall doctrine but it split four to four on the underlying question in the wake of Justice Scalia's untimely death. California has now persuaded the court to grant cert once again to reconsider the Hall case, and it's pretty clear where the states stand on this issue. In true bipartisan spirit, 45 of them, including Nevada itself, 
have signed an amicus brief supporting California's call to overrule the Hall decision. So we'll hear more about what the justices think about that old decision later this term. And while the Supreme Court is reconsidering and considering whether or not to overturn old doctrines in some areas, it may be looking to revive old doctrines in other areas. The leading example of that is a case called Gundy against the United States, which involves the non-delegation doctrine. As you all know, the non-delegation doctrine, at least in theory, prohibits Congress from delegating the quote unquote legislative power granted it under Article I to the executive branch. But as Justice Scalia put it in 2001, the court has quote, almost never felt qualified to second guess Congress regarding the permissible degree of policy judgment that can be left to those executing or applying the law. Gundy involves a non-delegation challenge to certain aspects of the Sex Offender, uh, Sex Offender Registry and Notification Act, also known as SORNA, which requires uh, sex offenders to register their offenses uh, after their conviction or after they finish their terms of sentences. Now, up until now, all 11 of the courts of appeals that have addressed the non-delegation challenge to SORNA have rejected it. But a few years ago, one uh, young upstarter on the 10th Circuit thought otherwise and penned a pretty vigorous dissent. And that young upstarter is now a member of the Supreme Court. It's, not, it's perhaps not any coincidence that Justice Thomas has also called for a revitalization of the doctrine in a separate opinion just a few terms ago. And at last year's Federal Society dinner, you all may recall that Justice Gorsuch went out of his way to discuss what he called that quote unquote dirty word, delegation. So let's look for that dirty word to come up a lot at this argument in uh, November. Another case that's potentially implicating an often neglected part of the Constitution is Tim's against Indiana, which will address whether the excessive fines clause of the Eighth Amendment is incorporated against the states. The Supreme Court has incorporated most of the provisions of the Bill of Rights against the states, uh, but there are a few outliers. The excessive fines clause is one of them. The other ones are uh, the often cited Third Amendment's prohibition on the quartering of soldiers, and the Fifth Amendment's grand jury indictment requirement, and the Seventh Amendment's jury trial in civil cases. The last time the court addressed incorporation was back in 2010 in McDonald against Chicago, when the court held that the Second Amendment was incorporated against the states. Four justices in that decision followed the court's traditional due process approach to incorporation, while Justice Thomas rejected that traditional approach and instead found in favor of corporation under the Privileges and Immunities Clause. We've not yet seen where Justice Gorsuch falls on this debate, and so I think this will really be a fascinating case and a strong candidate for the uh, law school case books in the years to come. There are a bunch of other important cases on the court's docket, and I'm not going to go into any amount of detail in these, but they include uh, a case addressing the extent of the federal government's authority under the Endangered Species Act, uh, and I think the animal at issue is the sandy gopher toad, uh, federal preemption under the Atomic Energy Act, the power of the states to tax federal employees, the authority of the courts to approve sci prey settlements. This has been an issue that has been important to the Chief Justice of the United States, and so I think that we're going to see uh, some advancement in the law in that area, and I think that'll affect a lot of settlements uh, when it comes to big ticket litigation. Uh, there are several questions involving the Armed Career Criminal Act, the Federal Arbitration Act, and federal Indian law. I could go on about these cases, but uh, in the interest of time, I think I'll leave that to the panelists to discuss. But I think that while these cases are interesting in their own right, the real key to the coming term is what's in the pipeline, because there are a lot of big cases in the pipeline, both ones that the court is currently considering whether to take and ones that I think have a fair chance of landing on the docket before the year is up. Next week, the court will hold its so-called long conference, at which it will consider a number of significant petitions that have been filed over the course of the summer. And amongst the issues that they're going to consider in those petitions are, first of all, whether Title VII's prohibition on employment discrimination because of sex includes discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. 
You may recall that until relatively recently, the lower courts have been pretty uniform in holding that Title VII was not intended to cover sexual orientation, but in the last uh, year or two, two courts, I think, have taken the issue in bank and have reversed those older decisions, and so I think that's an issue that uh, we will eventually have to see resolved in the Supreme Court, whether it's now or later, uh, I'm not sure. The other big case that they'll be considering at the long conference is whether a cross-shaped World War I memorial that sits out uh, in Bladensburg uh, violates the Establishment Clause under the so-called Lemon Test. And in the interest of full disclosure, I was actually counsel of record in that case in the Fourth Circuit, and so I'm recused from it. But I think it'll be a very interesting case to see how, however the new court is constituted, how it addresses these Establishment Clause questions, and in particular, how it deals with the Lemon Test, which as you know has been the subject of vigorous debate for many years. And if you look further out onto the horizon, the lower courts have issued a, n a number of decisions, uh, decisions on significant issues that are percolating through the courts of appeals and very well could end up before the Supreme Court by the end of this term, uh, including the constitutionality of the structure of independent agencies like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and namely whether the structure of that agency violates separation of powers principles, whether partisan gerrymandering claims are justiciable, something that we saw the Supreme Court step up to in several cases last term, and which could well come back to the court this term. Uh, the legality of the president's rescission of DACA. In DACA, that's the, 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 the program that allows certain illegal aliens who arrived into the country at a young age to stay and, and obtain work permits. Several courts have enjoined uh, President Trump's attempt to rescind the DACA program, but one court in Texas has actually held that to uh, implement the DACA program as it, was, uh, as it was written during the Obama administration would actually be illegal. So we don't yet have competing injunctions, but there's a distinct possibility that that'll happen, and it's an issue that could well get up to the Supreme Court this term. The other one is uh, the president's policy on transgender military service. Again, the subject of multiple injunctions in the lower courts. Oral argument is scheduled for October in the Ninth Circuit on that, and depending on how quickly the Ninth Circuit rules and whatever else happens, we might see that one on the court's docket. There are always uh, uh, Second Amendment issues that are pounding around in the federal courts, and we might well see something in that vein get up to the Supreme Court. And something that runs through uh, many of these cases is something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is the propriety of nationwide injunctions. That is, when a court at the behest of a single party enjoins a policy across the country in favor of litigants who are not, or, or uh, hypothetical litigants who are not actually before the court. So if even half or a quarter of those issues ended up before the Supreme Court this term, I think that we might be talking about this term as one of those blockbuster years that is comparable to what we saw last year. But of course, if my first year on the job has taught me anything, it's to expect the unexpected. We don't have to look far to see that that is a rule that we should all uh, uh, understand is, is before us. So I'll be following the court just like you will be, and I am sure that we're gonna be in for an interesting ride. But with that, I think I'll turn things over to the panelists to get into a deep discussion of these and other cases. Thank you for inviting me again, Dean, and everybody, I really hope you enjoy what promises to be an interesting panel discussion. Thank you. We could call the panelists forward, and, and while they're coming forward, I'll make a brief commercial announcement about the Federalist Society's National Lawyers Convention uh, scheduled for November 15th through the 17th. It's going to discuss a lot of the, the topics that, that uh, Noel Francisco mentioned, including uh, a Saturday debate between UVA Law School professor John Harrison and former Solicitor General Neil Katyal on nationwide injunctions. So with that, I turn things over to our panel. The Solicitor General has commanded the panel to be interesting, so you have your orders. Uh, welcome to a mini reunion of former Clarence Thomas law clerks. Three <laughs> of our panelists have that distinction. John Adams, whose name clearly is meant to pander to the Federalist Society. 
uh, graduated from the Virginia Military Institute in 1996, which of course is the year that the Supreme Court struck down VMI's male-only admissions policy, so that was an early lesson for him that the court's decisions have practical consequences. <clears throat> he predicted, by the way, in the VMI yearbook, the bomb, that some of his friends and he might someday run Richmond. There's still time, John. <laughs> He's now a partner at McGuire Woods in Richmond, co-chairing the Appeals and Strategic Issues team. Before that, he served in the White House Counsel's Office under President George W. Bush, and he was an assistant U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia. He also clerked for Judge Sentel on the D.C. Circuit. Jennifer Mascott is an associate professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School, where she directs the Supreme Court and administrative law clinics. She clerked for Justice Thomas and for Brett Kavanaugh on the D.C. Circuit. And during law school, she interned for Judge Leon at the D.C. District Court. She also served as a press secretary for two members of Congress, Eric Cantor of Virginia and Ann Northup of Kentucky, but was able to overcome the handicap of working for the press. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Papez is a partner at Winston and Strawn, where she's a member of the appellate and critical motions practice. After graduating from Harvard Law, she became a Thomas clerk, 10 years after graduating, that is. She got some real world experience first, working as a litigator at Kirkland and Ellis, and then served as the Deputy Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel in the George W. Bush administration. Tom Goldstein is the panel's token non-Thomas clerk member <laughs> and is the founding partner of the Goldstein Russell Law Firm. Tom has argued a remarkable 41 cases before the Supreme Court. Next month, he'll make it 42. He's taught Supreme Court litigation at both Stanford and Harvard and is the publisher of SCOTUS blog, the must-read internet spot for lawyers, reporters, Supreme Court junkies, and I know for a fact the justices themselves. And he'd also, and you'd never know it from looking at that face, is a world-class poker player. <laughs> so John, we'll start with you, if we could. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all for having me. Uh, it's great to be with uh, with friends again at the beginning of, uh, of what will be an exciting uh, Supreme Court term, no doubt. My job today is to talk about the criminal cases uh, on the docket. And I think what I'd like to do is um, I'll push the death penalty cases to maybe the next round. Uh, and I want to focus on what I think is one of the most interesting cases uh, before the court. Uh, and that is uh, the one that uh, the Solicitor General mentioned. Uh, Gamble versus United States. What a great name, by the way, for a criminal defendant taking a case to the Supreme Court. <laughs> Mr. Gamble, I, <clears throat> I will tell you at first, I laced this presentation with gambling references, but I've, I've managed to pull most of them out. Um, but as the SG said, in, in this case, the court is going to consider whether it's uh, time to overturn the separate sovereign's exception to the double jeopardy clause. And I think this is a really interesting case for three reasons beyond just the important question. First, this is a case that has something for everyone. And what I mean by that is uh, the petitioner, I think, has done a very good job of presenting the case on the grounds that, that the concept of this separate sovereign's exception really finds uh, no home in the plain text of, of the Constitution and, and no home with the original meaning of the double jeopardy clause. At the same time, uh, I'm willing to bet the Solicitor General is going to make very strong federalism arguments that the whole concept of the separate sovereign exception is designed uh, to reinforce the structure of dual sovereignty that we have uh, in this country. And so there's going to be a lot of competing ideas across ideologies in this case. Um, for those on the court um, who, who fundamental fairness is a driving factor, um, Mr. Gamble has a story to tell. He was uh, prosecuted in state court in Alabama and convicted of being a felon in possession of a firearm and sentenced to one year in prison. During the pendency of the case, uh, the U.S. attorney uh, charged him with being a felon in possession of a firearm, uh, and he was ultimately sentenced to four years in federal prison uh, for being a felon in possession of a firearm based on the exact same facts. So, so this case uh, has, uh, has some compelling uh, facts for some of the justices, I think. On the other hand, uh, there is uh, an argument out there floating that 
if you do away with the separate sovereigns exception, you could hinder federal enforcement of civil rights uh, laws. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of competing interests running across a lot of ideological uh, views in the case. And, and as, as the SG uh, mentioned, that in part uh, is why you have Justice Thomas and Justice Ginsburg together saying it's time to take a look at this doctrine. So that's really one of the reasons why I think it'll be interesting. The second is, at a time in this country where a lot of people are wondering when, how, and why will the court overrule uh, long-standing precedent, that is exactly what the petitioner uh, is asking the court to do in this case. So we will see with a uh, newly uh, constituted court how they approach that process. The petitioner has a couple things uh, going for him, I think. Um, one major factual change just in, in, in our legal system, and, and that is the just explosion of federal criminal law. Um, the, the probability of a citizen being charged by uh, the federal authorities and the state authorities for the exact same behavior um, is really off the charts compared to any time in history. Uh, the level of coordination between federal and state authorities is, is as high as I think it's ever been. And so with that factual shift in the country, I think some of the justice, justices will hang their hat on that. There's also a legal shift. Um, uh, Noel was mentioning incorporation. The double jeopardy clause was incorporated against the states in 1969. This is the first time the court has really considered a direct challenge since that uh, has occurred. And that could also provide some, some uh, rationale for them to, to take a second look at the doctrine. And then the third uh, reason why I think this is so fascinating is, is what if uh, Mr. Gamble's gamble pays off and he wins? Um, if you do what I do for a living, uh, there's going to be some really interesting strategic questions uh, being bandied around. Um, I spend most of my time representing uh, corporate clients in major investigations that involve federal, state, groups uh, often competing with one another. Uh, and, and I just think, I was thinking about the number of Blockburger memos associates at big firms are going to start doing if, this, if, this, if the court uh, actually overturns this doctrine, because there's going to be some neat strategic decisions, I think, made uh, in major litigation about when and how you resolve cases. Uh, so it'll be fascinating. The, the last piece is if you follow the petitioner's um, originalism argument and really in, in take it to heart, where that actually takes you is that judgments in foreign courts are, are really what's at stake. Um, and it'll be interesting. I don't think the court will touch that issue. It doesn't have to, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if it's not lingering out there at the conclusion of the, of the case. Can I ask you a quick question? As a practical matter, can't the federal government, or if it goes the other way, the state always find some different statute that has different elements, even though it's the, even though it's the same act? I mean, as a practical matter, can't you always come up with another charge? Uh, there's no doubt. Uh, there's a there's an amicus brief uh, filed, not supporting either party in the case, uh, by uh, uh, the Thurgood Marshall uh, Center, I believe, that that says Blockburger really makes, uh, at least with respect to the civil rights enforcement cases. Blockburger makes this a non-event. Um, I just, I think there's too many creative lawyers out there. Uh, that I, I, I think there's, there's going to be a lot of Blockburger litigation if, this, if the court goes that way. All right. Thank you. Elizabeth? Thanks so much. Um, I've got, hold on to your seats, the business cases. I'll start with the trio of arbitration cases that are up on the docket. Um, in all seriousness, actually, these are an interesting uh, group. The first is up for uh, argument on October 3rd, but all of them really, I think, um, you know, kind of have some lurking issues about, uh, you know, the, the constitutional and structural constitutional uh, issues that, that the society focuses on in its work and that is, are, you know, present when the court considers, you know, how far uh, federal judges can go in interpreting statutes and contracts. The first case uh, is called New Prime. This is the one that's up on October 3. Uh, came out of a case filed by a trucker 
uh, who was hired by a company as an independent contractor. That's what it says in his contract. And the contract has an arbitration clause, and they got into a fight about the wages. And he filed a federal class action. And the company said, sorry, you've got to arbitrate this. We want to move to compel. And the court said, no, we don't think so, because the Federal Arbitration Act has an exception that says where you have a fight about a contract of employment in the transportation industry, the FAA's you know, uh, arbitration mandate uh, doesn't apply. And the court said, well, really, it's our job at the threshold to decide whether this statutory exception applies. We're the court. We decide whether the statute applies. You don't get to take that to the ar arbitrator, as you said in your contract. So you think, OK, well, maybe. Uh, but really, it presents a pretty interesting question in the sense that, and, it, and, it's, and it's an economically consequential one on all sides, really, because you know the question is, the statute says the exception is for contracts of employment, and it's a nearly 100-year-old statute, and the Court of Appeals interpreted that language really away. Uh, there's a broad statutory background. There's plain language and text. There's other statutes that govern you know, these transportation sector contracts. And so this is really a case about, I think at heart or at bottom, how far can a, a court go away from the plain text of a statute? And it's a pretty important case when you think about it on all sides uh, from a structural standpoint. I mean, obviously, there are business expectations in these contracts, right? The cost of disputes are priced into the market for labor. And for the workforce, right, you care about what kind of jobs are available. Uh, what kind of benefits they are, what they pay. And if you, you know, upset that cart and you say that all of these uh, contracts that everybody in business and in the workforce thought maybe were subject to arbitration are really going to go to class actions, um, you know, that's going to get priced into the marketplace. So there's really, I think, a, uh, you know, some serious and, and economically pretty important issues on all sides of this case. And, you know, most importantly, I think, for the court's work and what we talk about here at the society, the issue is, Whatever you think about those, those points, there are a lot of stakeholders, and the case raises on all sides the kinds of issues that typically benefit from more of the debate and the airing and the consideration than one might get with a judge or a handful of judges right, in a federal court on one litigant's record. So it's, I think, you know, an important case in the background about, you know, there's a real practical impact economically and to people on all sides of these sorts of disputes in the business world and in the workforce about you know, how far courts should go in departing from statutory text that has been around for 100 years and is incorporated in contracts throughout an entire industry. So that's the first case, New Prime. The, uh, the second arbitration case is kind of a click down the same road in the sense that the, you know, the first case in New Prime is actually dealing with judicial interpretation of statutory text and an exception that exists. The second case called Shine, which is up for argument at the end of October, is also about you know, what, what, what a court can decide about a threshold issue of arbitration. But most interestingly, there the case and, and the court's application of whether the thing goes to the arbitrator or not doesn't even turn on language of a statute. It turns on an unstated exception the court said, the lower court said, about you know, whether uh, there are cases in which, even though there's an agreement to arbitrate, parties said a fight about whether it's arbitrable goes down to the arbitrator. If the court thinks the arbitration request is wholly groundless, it's not anywhere in the statute, it's not anywhere in the contract, the court can say, never mind your agreement to arbitrate. We've decided as, at the threshold that it's, uh, it's not arbitrable because we just think this is a frivolous case. So it's the court going to the merits of the dispute against the arbitration. So that's one click further down the road of the, you know, potentially upsetting you know, some pretty significant economic expectations in an area that, unlike New Prime, isn't even you know, hooking onto a statutory uh, provision or text, but it's an unstated exception. And the third of the three arbitration cases is one click beyond that. Uh, it's a case coming out of the Ninth Circuit, which has to do with class arbitration. Courts talked about this a lot. You know, the case that's most directly at issue is Stolt-Nielsen. That was about 10 years ago, uh, where the court said, look, uh, in these arbitration contracts, um, you know, the whole point is people are agreeing to do something. And so if there's an argument that the parties to the contract have agreed to class arbitration, you know, you think about that. You think about what a class action is and, you know, what sort of protections that involves. The thought of class arbitration is not something that, you know, one would sort of slip into quietly, I think, in most cases, at least not for the clients we, we, uh, we, we work with. And, you know, the court said you have to have an express indication. We saw the epic case last term that said you can have explicit waivers. This case, the Ninth Circuit said, well, you know, if you've got some language in the arbitration uh, agreement that says you're going to arbitrate 
in lieu of all other available remedies, and those remedies would include a class action in court, then at a minimum it's ambiguous whether you meant to put all of those remedies, including the class uh, mechanism into the arbitration, and then we're going to pick a state law rule that says if the employer drafted it, we construe any ambiguity against you, which means you've all of a sudden, little did you know, consented to class arbitration in this contract. Obviously, big surprise to a lot of people, not least the employer in the case, who said, wait a second, there's a preemption issue here. You know, we don't think this is ambiguous at all, okay, but there's no business and this is the federalism piece. You know, applying a state law background contract rule in this area. Again, big upset of the apple cart, structural. This is, this is a, you know, obviously a vertical issue. It's a federalism issue, not the horizontal separation uh, issues that we see in the other two. So tree of arbitration cases, I think some serious consequences to the business community, uh, as well as uh, the workforce, and are coming up with some constitutional gloss. I think, Pete, we'll see where the discussion takes us. Noel mentioned the class action case. There's one case, a, a securities law case that's coming up that the court granted over um, the Solicitor General's uh, bio that uh, has a Kavanaugh dissent. It's kind of an interesting vehicle because there's no question in the case that the statements at issue were uh, false and misleading, and it's going to get into some of the um, you know, ins and outs of when SEC rules and the securities laws uh, trigger primary liability for someone which can affect capital markets and also uh, you know, private actions, because if you have a primary liability under the securities laws, that's what opens the door to uh, private actions, not just SEC enforcement actions. And the last one is the Apple case on antitrust which is a platform case, your apps on your iPhones. You know, the question is, can you, as the buyer of the app, sue Apple because the price is too high because of what they charge the developer, which is like a 30% to be on that platform? Or does the Illinois Brick Doctrine, which is a prudential gloss, obviously, on the Clayton Act and who gets to sue for these things, does it mean that just the app developer, who's the direct purchaser of, of Apple's platform product for those purposes, are they the only ones? who get to bring the lawsuit, and the counter-argument is obviously they may have no incentive to bring it because they just pass the 30% charge off to you as the user, and so really they're not going to bring it as the direct purchaser. And the other thing is, is it really the same thing as the old direct purchaser cases? Because both sides, like the American Express case last year, you know, you've got a platform in the middle, and the two sides who are fighting over the price a bit are on either side. Only one maybe is the price setter. So that's another one to watch. All right, thank you very much. Jen? All right, thank you. So um, as someone who teaches administrative law, I'm going to talk about one potentially significant administrative law case this term that General Francisco already touched on in his remarks, and that's Gundy versus United States. And as General Francisco said, that that case potentially has uh, the, um, the capability of, of causing the court to revisit the non-delegation doctrine um, if the court decides to take a broad look um, at the case. And the non-delegation doctrine, if it's applied broadly by the court, could have a real impact on in terms of how Congress moving forward um, needs to legislate when it tries to regulate executive branch and administrative agency activity. That said, I also think it's possible the court could reach a narrow ruling in this case. Um, which would mean maybe it won't end up touching the non-delegation doctrine much at all. But to get to that, I'll just explain briefly what the statutory provision is that's at, that's at issue. Um, the Gundy case involves a challenge to a portion of the Federal Sex Offender and Registration Notification Act, General Francisco mentioned, is known as SORNA. And so the act requires individuals convicted of such offenses have to register with the government. They've got to notify the government when they move. The act was enacted in 2006. And so the particular aspect of the act that's being challenged here is the question about whether the act's registration requirements apply to people who were offend or who were convicted um, of a sex offense prior to 2006 when the act was put into place. And so the act it, in its text doesn't seem to explicitly answer that question. The relevant um, subsection says the attorney general shall have the authority to specify the applicability of the requirements of the subchapter to sex offenders convicted before the enactment of this chapter. Um, and so the text of the statute arguably leaves the question up to the attorney general basically to decide whether you know everybody convicted of these offenses before 2006 has to comply with the new requirements. That said, interestingly, when the act was first passed and the attorney general was tasked with interpreting what does this provision mean, um, in issuing regulations interpreting the provision, the attorney general's office said at the time that actually one entirely plausible interpretation of the whole statutory scheme is that actually the act by its own terms requires everybody, including those convicted earlier, to register. And maybe this provision is just saying the attorney general is going to tell um, 
uh, those convicted previously on um, how, like when exactly they need to register and how exactly they need to register. And so the argument there is that the act generally says offenders shall register. The definition of offenders is fairly broad based. And so the attorney general at the time thought that there was an argument that just the act on its own terms made the requirements applicable to everyone. Um, Interestingly, however, in 2012, the Supreme Court took a look at this case and I think has kind of taken that interpretation really off the table. In a case called Reynolds versus United States, it was a 7-2 decision written by Justice Breyer, where basically the court determined that it, it was not the case that these uh, registration requirements just became um, effective against uh, those who earlier offenders just by the act's terms that the attorney general needed to carry the act into effect. Um, Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg dissented in that case. And interestingly, Justice Scalia, in his dissent, said he was partly uncomfortable with Justice Breyer's interpretation because he thought the way Justice Breyer interpreted the provision raised non-delegation problems. Um, and that's kind of fascinating because Justice Scalia himself actually didn't seem to think that there what should be a strict non-delegation doctrine, but just to get a little bit more into what the non-delegation doctrine is and how it would relate here. Um, the non-delegation doctrine, as General Francisco um, hinted at, is this idea that in Article I, when it vests the legislative power in Congress, Congress then has to be coming up with new broad-based rules to govern um, you know, private activity. And so if Congress leaves, um, you know, too many holes in a statute or leaves too much discretion up to executive, to the executive branch or to administrative agencies, then Congress has improperly delegated away its lawmaking role. Um, the, the challenge with this doctrine over the years, and as an administrative law professor up until about a year or so, you know, we would typically tell students, if you're ever looking for a reason to challenge administrative action, don't base it on the non-delegation doctrine, because the court's not really enforced the principle. It's only found two provisions um, in all of its history to be um, unconstitutional under the non-delegation doctrine 80 years ago um, at the height of the New Deal. Um, and the court has upheld very broad-based standards for administrative agencies. If, it, if Statutes that say the administrative agency needs to act in the public interest, for example, have been found to give enough guidance to agencies that they do not improperly delegate legislative power. The court's also made statements that suggest if an administrative agency can possibly figure out how to apply this law, then it gives enough guidance. The catchphrase is whether there's an intelligible principle or not. So um, as General Francisco mentioned, Justice Gorsuch himself has uh, raised um, constitutional questions about SORNA, it has um, indicated an interest in revisiting this doctrine, so has Justice Thomas. That said, I don't know, you know, it'll be interesting to see if the court really decides to get to that question or if it decides to hand down a narrower ruling. Because there could be an interesting coalition in this case of those who think there might be a non-delegation problem, but also those who are thinking about the rights of criminal defendants. And one might argue, actually, that the provision, which, which seems to leave the applicability of, of the retroactivity of the provision up to the attorney general, arguably gives no standard, at least right in that provision itself. So that it's possible the court could say this is an even more extreme example than um, in cases in the past where, um, where we've ruled on this issue. And so, um, and, and so far, there's an interesting alliance of people. There were many amicus briefs filed in the case um, supporting Mr. Gundy from the most constitutionally conservative outside groups to, um, to uh, the, the ACLU are all you know, raising different arguments about why um, it seems unconstitutional in this standpoint to leave it completely up to the attorney general whether to um, impose these new um, requirements with criminal um, consequences to, um, to people who were uh, convicted a long time ago. All right, thank you. And Tom? Thanks so much. I, I did want to pause just to thank the Federal Society. I generally appear at ACS events with the enemy and <laughs> wanted to just say that I, I think that the Federal Society has done so much for the law and more so than any other organization, including the ACS, uh, in providing a forum, in encouraging competing views, and just saying, like, let the best ideas win out. And so I think it's just made a tremendous contribution, and the organization is, is fantastic, and it's a great pleasure to get to be here with you. Uh, I thought I... <laughs> to you. Um, I may get a free membership. The... Um, <laughs> I thought that I'd take just a second to offer a couple of thoughts uh, with respect to the cases that other folks have mentioned and then 
discuss two of the cases that Noel did, which involve the excessive fines clause and property rights. Uh, with respect to the dual sovereign doctrine, I think of this case under a different name, which is the state of New York versus Paul Manafort. Uh, and I do think that, that its kind of immediate consequence in the current political environment does relate to this debate over the scope of the president's pardon power and whether it is that uh, states with Democratic attorney generals will try and circumvent any putative pardon and what it means to the people caught up in the investigation in their assessment of the prospects of a pardon. Because this really is the question, if New York were to repeal its prohibition against such uh, prosecutions, which it's thinking about doing, of whether an individual who is prosecuted and convicted in the federal system and then is pardoned with respect to the federal crimes could then be uh, prosecuted by a state, which is obviously uh, a very, very significant issue. Uh, and is the, personal, the reason why I'm personally watching the case uh, most closely. Also with respect to uh, John's correct point about precedent on precedent, this is a real dilemma for the left in the court, I think. Justice Ginsburg, as John mentioned, uh, has suggested revisiting this doctrine. But we had a similar situation last term in a case involving uh, the prohibition on states taxing out-of-state sales where ordinarily one would have expected the more liberal members of the court to support overturning that precedent. This is essentially can Amazon charge you sales tax case. Uh, and we represented the state saying uh, they can, and I apologize for that for those of you who buy things on the interwebs. Um, but the, uh, the left of the court, by and large, would not support us because I think that the court, the, those members of the court, when they think about overturning a precedent that has been reaffirmed multiple times in American constitutional law, basically says, Am I willing to overrule Roe versus Wade? Or instead, do I want to erect an extremely high bar to that move? So I think that the left faces an enormous dilemma with respect to getting rid of some pre-Warren court precedents, for example, like this one, where you would ordinarily expect them to be deeply concerned with multiple prosecutions of criminal defendants. So I don't know what it is that they will do. Um, with respect to Elizabeth's uh, cases regarding arbitration, I would just pause more, a little bit more briefly on the transportation one. Elizabeth frames the case as, as I think the companies do, is basically, is there law? Uh, that's the question presented in the case, because they view the statute to, when it says uh, uh, um, contracts relating to employment and transportation, I mean, it's, this person has to be an employee versus somebody who's an independent contractor. I would just push back a little bit to say that there is a, the other side is invoking the text just as much. We, we don't think, for example, a case on employment law would not include independent contractors. The question is whether the statute is limited strictly to employees or not, and if the, empl the employer or the business here may have the stronger argument, but I don't think that the employees are uh, so divorced from the statutory text as to basically just be making a policy argument. Uh, with respect to Jennifer's uh, description, um, I think that the one really big implication of the non-delegation doctrine, if it were to get life breathed back into it, relates to the president's tariffs. There is a major constitutional challenge that's pending right now over the statute that says that the president can impose tariffs when he makes a national security determination and basically says the president can do whatever he wants and he has proceeded to do whatever he wanted. Uh, each day he has wanted to do something, you know, perhaps even more aggressive. Uh, and the Supreme Court previously held under the non-delegation doctrine that that statute is constitutional, but it wasn't an era in which, like now, the non-delegation doctrine basically is regarded as a typo. And also, it was a time at which it was thought that the president's actions were reviewable under the Administrative Procedure Act, which is no longer regarded as true. And so if the court were to take a more searching look under the non-delegation doctrine, that's probably where it would first have the, the greatest bite. Um, the other thing about that move is that it may be, uh, uh, doctrinally, is it may be the other half of the court's concern with Chevron. So, of course, there's been a lot of attention given to whether the administrative state has just run wild. And those who favor narrowing Chevron say, look, we need to take these, these uh, ambiguities away from the courts and put them in the article, th or, or not have agencies do them. Well, you would ordinarily think what we really want is the agencies shouldn't be dealing with all of this and aggregating so much power because it should be Congress that is writing more clear statutes and handling these policy judgments as the elected representatives of the government. And that would have to be the job of the non-delegation doctrine to force Congress to write more clear 
laws that actually tell the agencies what to do. But whether the Supreme Court is actually willing to go down that road and impose those requirements is, I think, uh, much more doubtful. Uh, the two cases that I wanted to discuss are Tim's and Nick. Tim's is the excessive fines clause. As Noel said, most of the uh, Bill of Rights has been incorporated against the states, except mostly stuff dealing with juries. Uh, and in fact, the Supreme Court multiple times has said that the provisions of the Eighth Amendment are incorporated against the states, but it's never had an excessive fines case. This case comes in what we regard as a fantastic vehicle for the defendant because it is in an era in which we have become increasingly concerned with civil forfeiture and a Supreme Court that is increasingly concerned with the plaintiff's bar. And those two meet in the Tim's case. In Tim's, uh, the, the, uh, the party who's contesting the forfeiture here was driving around in a Land Rover that he got with his inheritance from the passing of one of his parents. And he sold uh, heroin in two undercover buys to police officers. The maximum he got as a sentence, a year of home confinement and then five years probation, the maximum criminal fine was $1,000. Uh, he thought the case was over when he got a letter from a plaintiff's attorney saying, we represent the state of Indiana. We want to forfeit the entire car and take our contingent fee interest in it. Um, he thought that was terribly unfair, as did the trial court and the Court of Appeals. But the Indiana Supreme Court said, well, the Supreme Court hasn't, as a formal matter, incorporated the uh, excessive fines clause uh, as against the states. And so the Supreme Court took up that invitation, I'm sure, to do just that. But in an era of uh, really aggressive forfeiture, both at the federal level, but also importantly at the state and local level, this will probably be quite significant on checking that, uh, probably what I think most people regard as an abusive practice. The Nick case is uh, about property rights, which is near and dear to many uh, of you. Uh, and it is, as Noel explained, uh, about the Williamson County Doctrine. The Williamson County Doctrine was intended originally to not be that surprising or that troublesome. It said basically, OK, uh, your right against a taking says that the government won't take your property without just compensation. It doesn't say the government can't take your property. So we need to find out for you to have a full claim whether you're going to get just compensation. In order to find out if you're going to get just compensation from the state you have to, or the local government, you have to ask them. That was basically what was going on. Unfortunately, it has grown enormously in its consequences and its implications. Probably most significantly, what it means is that you have to go to state court. And that means when you go to state court to say, look, you've taken my property without any uh, right to do so, you actually have to say, you don't have any right to do so because this is a taking. And you end up litigating the essential elements of your takings case as part of exhaustion. You never get to go to federal court. Uh, in addition, it can cause really unfair delays vis-a-vis uh, -vis what you would ordinarily think of as bringing a constitutional civil claim. So here, uh, these folks in Pennsylvania, they have a farm. This legislation gets passed saying, if you have a graveyard or anybody buried on your farm, you have to let people in. She files an objection with the, in the state courts, and the state courts say, well, uh, you know, at this point, nobody is really trying to enforce this against you, so we're not going to adjudicate your claim. And she's just stuck. There is a statute to which she is subject, so she ought to have constitutional standing, but they don't know whether or not there's going to be any compensation. So many times the Supreme Court have been urged to overrule Williamson County, including because of these implications, and it had passed up that opportunity multiple times. I think the fact that the court took the case up indicates the handwriting is on the wall. All right, thank you. For the second round, uh, we should talk about some of the cases that the solicitor said may be coming before the court. But of course, the problem is, uh, who knows what court will be deciding whether to take these cases. So to address the question that undoubtedly has been discussed at every table in this room, uh, we find ourselves in this unusual position with the Kavanaugh nomination, and I wonder what your observations are about that, about what's going to happen. Will, by the first Monday in October, we have nine justices? John, you want to take a shot? Sure, sure. Um, I'm going to uh, start by um, mentioning something that we do know, and that is that we're, you know, we're going to have a court without Justice Kennedy. And, and that is uh, going to have an enormous impact, I think, in one particular area. And, and again, I've been charged with the criminal side of the House, um, and that's the death penalty cases. And, and I just think there is, um, it, it, it's just a fact, right, that if you, if you want to know what evolving standards of decency have been in the United States for the last 15 years, it's Justice Kennedy has made that decision. Um, you can go back and look at um, 2002, Atkins versus Virginia, 
providing the fifth vote in that case. 2005, authored Ro Ro Roper v. Simmons. 2008, authored Kennedy v. Louisiana. Um, at the court this term, uh, we already have a case that uh, before the court, um, uh, Madison versus Alabama, which will turn on another Kennedy opinion. Uh, and that is how the court's going to apply uh, Panetti versus Quarterman. And, and so in that case, what Justice Kennedy said was you, you could not execute a, a prisoner who cannot reach a rational understanding of the reason for the execution. And that standard has been, um, I think, difficult for, for folks to apply. So we have this case now before the court where uh, um, Mr. Uh, Madison is, um, has had multiple strokes and he suffers from dementia. And the cert petition actually presented it, the, presented the question in, I think, a more stark way than just, you know, can he reach a rational understanding? They said he does, doesn't remember it. He has dementia. He does not recall the facts which uh, caused him to be convicted of the crime. And if that's the case, uh, under, under, under Panetti, can he be executed? Uh, the case was granted before Justice Kennedy announced he was um, departing the court. Um, and so you have a newly constituted court taking its first step into, uh, into death penalty jurisprudence uh, without Justice Kennedy. And I think uh, in terms of, uh, you know, assuming that Brett Kavanaugh is sitting there as a justice, which I, I, I believe is going to happen, um, um, we don't know much about Brett Kavanaugh's death penalty uh, thought. But I'm, I'm going to place a bet that it's probably different than Justice Kennedy's. And I think you're going to see a court that is going to um, approach the death penalty in a very different way uh, moving, moving forward. So from a, from a criminal law side of the house, I think that is an area that is going to be significantly impacted. Jen, you're a former uh, Kavanaugh clerk. What's it like to watch all this happening? Well, I, you know, so I'm obviously not a new, you know, neut neutral party here. I testified on behalf of Judge Kavanaugh in the Senate, and I clerked for him his, you know, first year on the bench. So I've known him for 12 years, him and his family, and have considered him a great boss and mentor and friend during all, all of that time. Um, and, and so, you know, um, if we were going to talk about the court next year, you know, one thing that John's remarks made me think about, it, um, and also Tom touching on Chevron and tying that together with the um, non-delegation doctrine, which I found is interesting, is assuming, as John said, if, if it does end up being that Judge, that Judge Kavanaugh becomes Justice Kavanaugh in the next few weeks, um, I do think it's interesting that at least in the area of administrative law, um, which has become a more of a focal point at the court over the years, whether it's Chevron or non-delegation doctrine, it's interesting that Judge Kavanaugh Kavanaugh may actually not bring as significant of a change of Justice Kennedy as we would think, because Justice Kennedy, um, in one of his last opinions before stepping down, uh, really questioned the viability of Chevron and whether um, we should be deferring to administrative agencies as much. And I think Tom does a good job and say that at the end of the day, one reason that might be raising more concerns now than it would have in the past is because of how broadly Congress is legislating. And so if the court does actually tighten that up, as Tom says, in the Gundy case, maybe that will take some of the stakes off of Chevron. But, um, but um, both, both jurists over the years um, have, have, have said things that um, suggest that they have a, a, a view of accountability with Justice Kennedy joining um, the chief and in, in the Free Enterprise Fund and other decisions, where they have a fairly strong traditional view of executive accountability, where one replacing the other wouldn't make, perhaps in that area of the law, as dramatic of a change as it might, as one might think. Pete, Elizabeth, can I, yeah. Can I just say sure? Something? Because, I mean, Jennifer is being extraordinarily uh, kind and restrained, and that is, I do think, you know, part of your question, or the thrust of your question, went to Judge Kavanaugh, and I, and Jennifer says that she can't be objective, and hopefully I can be a little bit and say some things that I think probably are on the mind of, of folks in the room, and that is, so I know Judge Kavanaugh, but not well, and he taught my class uh, a few times, um, but I hope that people can fairly say, without undercutting the significance of the claim that's been made, but to not let what has happened over the past few days cloud 
what, you know, this is somebody who I disagree with ideologically very significantly, but I do think it's really important to come back to, this is someone's, a human being's reputation that had been built up over the course of decades. And this is a man who's been in public service for decades, and every single person that came and said anything about him, again, not derogating, the, just bracketing this, the, what has been talked about in this accusation, uh, from several decades ago, but this is a person of unbelievable professionalism, integrity, and public service that is, so far as I know, uh, from people, anybody who's known him for a significant period of time is uniformly admired. And so I just don't want us, because this is a very uh, fraught question, it's a question that um, deserves attention and fair consideration. Uh, and hopefully it will get it. But we, sh you know, on the question of his integrity and everything like that, I just hope that we, when we get past this 10 days, we have not lost sight of someone who is, I think, an extraordinary person, and has, you know, he's in, has lived a remarkably kind and generous and life, deserving of unbelievable respect, more than the great, great majority of us. So, I just wanted to say that about him. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and I should just interject. One reason I, I didn't say say more along those lines is because I, I have I have actually been saying so much in in other settings recently. So I trust you know anybody interested in my position would be able to reference you know things I said in my testimony and, and since then also um, firmly talking about his impeccable record and uniform integrity and credibility. Yeah, and to that point, I mean to turn back to the jurisprudence, which is you know extraordinary. We've got 12 years of jurisprudence on the D.C. Circuit. It's careful. It's thorough, I think, you know, in my lane on the business cases when we look at the docket. You know, certainly that's not necessarily the realm of five fours, you know, routinely, but I think there are some cases that are, are close. Uh, we've seen them in the business on business context, also in business and other interests. So, you know, a, an eight member court can certainly handle them. You know, someone on Tom's blog, I think, recently kind of crunched the numbers and looked at, uh, you know, what's the impact potentially of Justice Kennedy not sitting uh, in some of the business cases. I think certainly in cases where we're looking at statutory interpretation, and I didn't mean to suggest, for example, in the trucking case that the other side just making a policy argument. I think, you know, taking this jurisprudence, you know, in, in hindsight, you know, it's, there's a textual argument certainly to be made that the statute just begins and ends the matter about whether this is in or out, but I think if you go back, and we've seen Justice Kennedy do this, and you look at the context, this is the FAA case about the trucker, when you look, what did Congress mean by contracts of employment in 1925 when it passed this act? You know, there's a body of law there that's a backdrop, and then this exception exists because other statutes, several of them in fact, uh, address what happens to folks in these industries and how their disputes should be, uh, you know, handled and what the costs and, and allocations are there. So I do think that's an area that, where it wouldn't be affected. I do think, you know, when you look back at Judge Kavanaugh's uh, jurisprudence on the D.C. Circuit, and it's quite remarkable, he has a very strong uh, a track record, I think, in things like securities law cases and some of the financial uh, services sector cases. So I think there, you know, I think on the statutory interpretation, I don't know that a lot would change. I think you might see some differences if he were on the court uh, in how some of the, you know, securities uh, cases or other cases uh, in, in, you know, the, the what I'll call the business or, or economic sector would break, and so that'll be an interesting thing to watch depending how the court uh, seats. But do you all agree that if he's not, if there's no decision on the confirmation by the time of the long conference, then the court will probably do what it did after the Scalia death and sort of pull back and not be willing to take really difficult questions? Well, I do think, so a few things about that. Just as a formal matter, the calendar tells us one thing, and that is he won't be there by the long conference. Uh, just the the Senate calendar will get in the way. Now, you might miss it by days. You might not miss it by much. And of course, everybody knows that the court requires four votes to grant, and it's practice in the circumstances. If there are three, then the court will simply roll the case over in the expectation that a justice may well come and be able to provide a fourth vote. Probably the, what you're talking about then is, what we then move to is the bigger picture. I will say that I think that while you know the court has been more conservative, not as conservative as some would hope, you're looking about at several mutually reinforcing phenomena that are about to happen. One is, of course, that uh, conservative organizations will be uh, more enthusiastic about bringing questions to the court and organizations on the left will be much more reticent because Justice Kennedy on a number of issues, for example, we end up talking about the Title VII uh, LGBT case and the like, there were, there were questions that in, in the death penalty community that they were 
a little bit more enthusiastic about putting in front of him as a fifth vote. But then inside the building as well, just as outside groups are less certain about what the justice might have done, I think so too members of the court may well have been less certain and hesitated to grant cases. So I think now a as the court's more conservative majority becomes more cemented, whether by Brett Kavanaugh or you know, any number of other people, the left may truly come to rue the day that they tried to block Brett Kavanaugh from getting on the Supreme Court. And whoever is going to get on the court, because there is exactly a 0% chance that Mitch McConnell and Chuck Grassley will allow this thing to get past the lame duck. I think we ought to recognize that. The prospect that the Democrats will take the Senate, albeit thin, is realistic. And so they will do whatever is necessary in order to make sure that there is a ninth member of the court there by the time you know, a Democratic majority could take over in the next Senate in January. Um, so given that prospect, I think you will expect within a few months to see a shift towards more aggressive grants by more conservative justices. It may take several years to materialize. But in the very short term, I suppose the court would slow down. But the, the Scalia situation was different. I mean, Mitch McConnell had said, we're going to hold the seat open. So you're looking at you know, a year or so. Here, we're talking probably a course of a couple of months. And so I wouldn't expect that phenomenon to cause the court to pull back so much. What you could well see is the chief justice in situations with eight justices has been quite good at trying to get to a court. And so if, in the cases argued in October, for example, uh, they can't, they're 4-4 four, four on the big question. You may see quite narrow decisions then, rather than either rolling the cases over or digging them, dismissing them. If they're committed to reaching the big question, then I expect what will happen is you'll hear argument, and then the case will be conferenced. They'll recognize that they're 4-4. Four, four. They'll wait for a confirmation, and then they'll set the cases for re-argument. And so you will, I, I wouldn't expect it to slow down that much. All right, I want to leave time for questions from all of you, but let's do talk about some of the issues that the solicitor mentioned as possible cases. We've been talking about granted cases, cases that might get up here. One of them is DACA, um, where the Texas court recently decided not to grant an injunction, but made it pretty clear they thought the law was uh, unconstitutional. So do you think DACA is going to make it up here in time, any of you? Not all at once, please. <laughs> it's, uh, John? Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced it is, um, but again, it, 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 I'm just not as convinced it's going to move as quickly as, as the general does. Yeah. I would think that in the absence of competing national injunctions, the court's policy of requiring <laughs> issues to percolate through the courts of appeals is so strong that there's not a, and there isn't such hostility on the court to DACA that they'll insist on stepping in. If there's a real practical problem, and that is the United States says, give me a break, what am I supposed to do? I've got two competing rulings here that I'm subjected to. But unless and until that becomes a concrete practical problem, so it'll get there, assuming the administration sticks to this policy, which I'm sure it will, but I think it would be a term out. Yeah, it was interesting that the Texas court in denying the injunction said, you know, there are people depending on this now, and it just would be too much... It, and if you look at the factors for injunctions, it would, it would be too upsetting to that side. Uh, you mentioned, and the solicitor did too, this question of nationwide injunctions, which has become a big thing for the Trump administration. Uh, what, what traction do you think the administration might get in getting the court to say, knock it off? Any thoughts on that? This is obviously, All the traction obviously in the world. something, okay. I mean, I, I cannot imagine this court, because if you just look at the instances in which these injunctions have been in, entered, they have almost uniformly been on the left in circumstances in which somebody goes to the Ninth Circuit or the Fourth Circuit uh, contesting, for example, the travel ban or, uh, you know, when it also happened with respect to <laughs> same-sex marriage. Uh, members of the court at argument have expressed concern about this, in separate opinions have expressed concern about this. The other thing is, the truth of the matter is, the Supreme Court views itself as the grown-up court that wears the big pants, <laughs> and the district courts is kind of like, okay, uh, we had to go through that. And the idea that one district judge has mu as much power as a majority of the Supreme Court to enjoin a statute passed by the Congress, uh, which is a process that the Supreme Court even is, is well aware of the difficulties uh, in Congress, but is nonetheless institutionally respectful of it. I cannot imagine that the Supreme Court is going to say, 
it's fine in ordinary circumstances for a district judge to enter an injunction nationally. Now, whether there could be special circumstances, <laughs> people acknowledge that that can happen. But in the absence of some immediacy, I think they, they view the people who make decisions nationally for American law to be sitting in that building, not in San Francisco. <laughs> Well, the only thing I was going to add is it would be interesting if this issue, you know, it, it's true that the Supreme Court, I guess, could, could weigh in, but it's also interesting that, that I believe there's been legislation introduced in Congress. So would this ever be a time when perhaps Congress would actually take the lead and sort of address and step in and just simply say the courts don't have the jurisdiction to, um, to issue these injunctions? The, the question is, will Congress take the lead? The answer is probably no. no. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the, the solicitor also mentioned the Title VII case, and there is a split among the circuits. So it would seem that the court will eventually take this. Do you, do you agree? I guess the only question is whether it's going to take it this term. Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's always the question. This, this is maybe one, too, where the you know, composition timing of the court may affect it. You know, this is the kind of case where I think that might be a calculus. I obviously can't speak for the conference, but certainly I think in, you know, in, in our world, you know, that's the kind of, it's the be careful what you ask for and the cert seeking you know, calculus that, that could be impacted there. So I think that's a, a, a we'll see. Calculus meaning you think they would be inclined to take it or inclined not to? Uh, you know, it's hard to say. I, again, that's, I think they, they might. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty, I think, now. And then the question is, you know, is it better to see how things shake out? Wait, there'll be another case, right? I mean, the split's not going to go away. And isn't this probably even more so true on the transgender issue? You've got the Fourth Circuit case involving the student in Virginia. You've got another case now that's sort of the opposite from Pennsylvania of parents suing a school district that has a policy saying students can use the bathroom that matches their gender identity, and, and the parents are suing, claiming that's a violation of their privacy rights. So the, it seems pretty early on for this issue. Would you agree on that? Yeah, yeah bathrooms, uh, definitely. I think the thing about Title VII and employment, so this is the question of whether sex discrimination includes sexual orientation discrimination. There are cert petitions coming up to the Supreme Court pending right now from both sides. Right. And so I think that's a situation in which the court views itself as having an institutional responsibility. If there is a true conflict, and this has been around for a while, they just, some of those strategic calculus about whether or not we want this issue or not tend to drop out, and it becomes much more bureaucratic. And so in the, ex now, if they really believe that they weren't gonna have a ninth justice for a long time, that could be a different matter because this is going to be very, very, very close on ideological grounds in all likelihood. But given that there's, it's overwhelmingly likely that there'll be a ninth justice, I think they'll grant one of these petitions. And, and in fact, just to make it clear, there are cases pending. Yes, right. yeah, the cert petitions are pending right now, one from the employer and one from the employee on this circuit split. Right, all right, uh, let's hear from you all. If you have questions, if you could just uh, raise your hand so we can see you. And I see there's a microphone there. Uh, so if you could uh, either wait for someone to bring it to you or bring yourself to it one way or the other, uh, happy to take your questions now. Or just stand up or telepathy, and think it and I'll figure it out. Break into song. Any questions? Yes, sir, here we go. Uh, Sorry to bore you with antitrust. Uh, Amex, uh, Ohio versus American Express. I'm, I'm curious, first of all, are, do you see any um, trade cases like that coming up again? And secondly, do you see that decision in, in June as uh, really kind of a, um, a wonky um, antitrust decision? Uh, you know, changing the, the, the relevant uh, product market definition. I was kind of surprised they did that. Um, but, um, uh, so do you see that really as, as, as really focused in on the antitrust issues and trying to move antitrust law a little bit? Or do you really see it as just kind of a knee jerk, let's make it harder for people to bring class actions against big companies? I mean, you know, I can't say where the court was coming from. I think it was a surprise doctrinally, obviously, the substitutability test for defining a market. This is the case last year, it was a credit card case. Uh, the American Express case where, you know, the court in analyzing the case, you know, the, the, the lower courts had sort of debated what, what is the market for a credit card transaction, right? Because you have the customer on the one side, you have, in this case, Amex in the middle, like a platform, then you have a merchant over here, and Amex is connecting you with your credit card to the merchant you want to buy something from, and is, and is kind of serving as a two-sided platform. 
The case in the lower courts started out by saying Amex had some rules that kind of restricted competition on the merchant side. And that's where the antitrust analysis was focused. And under old doctrine, it was because when you look at a market, everyone was arguing what Amex sells to the merchant is not a substitute or interchangeable with what Amex sells to the cardholder, right? Your credit card, your air miles, whatever, the merchant's getting a processing service so you're not in the same market. That was the old doctrine. You know, when the court took that case up, and that was a 5-4, and I would note, you know, the SG, uh, you know, I think was bottom side there, said don't take this. They did. You know, I was at that argument. I, I think, you know, the court did struggle a bit at the argument with, you know, where the case was. So we have what we have. I think, you know, when, when you read that opinion, and Justice Thomas issued the opinion, um, it made sense in the context of the case. I think why there was kind of a, a cautionary note around it was, what is it going to mean even for cases like the Apple case? Because that was kind of a convergence of, you know, these new economy, these double-sided platforms. And again, the, to the, what, you know, what the society does and what the courts do, where does the court's work intersect in applying sort of settled doctrines and does it matter if they're constitutional versus statutory versus judicial, right? Like the market definition test isn't in the Constitution. It's not a statutory test. It was a judicial way of getting through these cases. And I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see what, if any, threads of that Amex decision you see in the Apple case on these platforms, where it doesn't fit the old notion of, the, uh, of, of how people do business. And so what does that mean for Illinois BRIC? That's another judicial gloss on the Clayton Act. So I think it's actually quite interesting. And I, my, my, my gut is, I don't know. I mean, I think these cases are hard, and they do push boundaries. And then, you know, you get to the classic question of, you know, is it the court's job to be doing this, or should it get bounced back to, you know, whether it's a legislative forum or some other, uh, at least a district court on a more, you know, a broader record to see what happens? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. My name is Herman Bauma, and I wanted to get back to this, the current saga involving uh, Mr. Kavanaugh. Um, I was a little surprised that most members of the panel weren't willing to express any strong opinions about what's currently going on. I was wondering if, if you all, some or all of you, could indicate uh, to what extent you think uh, Senator Grassley should try to accommodate uh, the accuser uh, and to consider her, the conditions she, under which she wants to testify, or do you think uh, he should basically say enough is enough and we're just going to go forward under my conditions. Just interested in hearing your opinions on that. Well, well, I'll step in because you, since you say you're, you're surprised that the panel hasn't spoken up, and again, I just as a, a former clerk and somebody who testified on the judge's behalf have been quite outspoken about his character and his integrity. I've known him for 12 years, consider him a mentor. As Tom pointed out, people uniformly throughout his walks of life, his career, have expressed support throughout the confirmation process. Um, you know, colleagues, clerks, um, people from his neighborhood. He's a person of service. He's a person of character. Um, obviously, he's a brilliant jurist as well with more than 300 opinions on the D.C. Circuit. So I think in this case, um, you know, obviously the Senate's going to have to decide what process it feels most comfortable with. I mean, everybody you know, deserves to be listened to, deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. You know, Judge Kavanaugh has spoken clearly, you know, categorically denied um, the, the allegations raised and has requested an opportunity to be able to, um, you know, as soon as possible, clear his name in a hearing. Um, you know, and, and, and these allegations have been around now for a while without him being directly confronted with them, even, even after having been in 32 hours of hearings and answering 1,300 questions and having 65 private meetings. Um, so the Senate, I think, will decide what process is fair, but, um, but I think it seems, you know, fairly clear right now what the, what the party's positions are, and, um, and hopefully, um, you know, we can, we, this, this will all move forward soon. Yeah, I, I think they're gravitating towards some towards a solution. I mean, there are competing interests here, including the fact, you know, this uh, this needs to be ventilated. Everybody seems to agree. On the other hand, it's coming very late at the end of the process. Uh, everybody recognizes that as well. And so I think that the disagreements are relatively marginal. I don't think the difference between Monday versus Thursday could possibly be dispositive here. The order in which people speak. Uh, my intuition was that, of course, if someone wanted to make an accusation, you would hear from them first, and then the judge would be able to respond. There is this interesting fact that in Anita Hill, it went in the opposite order, which I, I actually don't understand, but there is that, that contrary example. The question of whether you would subpoena the, uh, the third person alleged to have been there, uh, I think is probably the most fraught one because of, of concerns on both sides. 
Um, but I, I do think we're gonna we're gonna get through this, uh, and it's gonna be in a form that people can regard as fair. I, I will say, as someone again who comes at this from the opposite ideological side, I have been impressed with Chuck Grassley. I know that there are people who want more process and the like, but if you sat through those hearings as I did, he was, for, if you were to take the first day, for example, when he was cut off immediately and there was this organi organized effort by the Democrats to try and say, we shouldn't do this, this is ridiculous, we haven't gotten these documents, which, you know, they're raising concerns about that, for example. He showed extraordinary patience uh, with that and wanted to genuinely seem to want to make sure everybody got heard. So while I do think that this situation is fraught with issues of age and gender because you're talking about the Republicans do happen to have all men obviously on their side of this committee, I, I did just want to pause and say, well, I am, you know, I do really think that she deserves uh, a fair hearing on this question, as does the judge. Uh, I've been impressed by Grassley, and I think he's trying to get there rather than doing something that's, you know, absolutely emphatic and cuts the process off and gives her the least opportunity possible. Any other thoughts on this? Well, I mean, uh, look, obviously, <clears throat> obviously from the outset, uh, the timing, right, has just been really problematic. I mean, uh, for this to have sat there where it did, undisclosed for so long, has created now this problem we're dealing with. My, like everyone else, I think the senator's got to make a, a, a calculated political decision on what he can, what he can do, what he can't do, um, what what I think is the bedrock, and, and Tom, you mentioned this earlier. Um, there's going, I, I just believe there is going to be a Trump-nominated Supreme Court justice sitting on on that court. Uh, you know, by the time we get through the lame duck session, so I think what Grassley is doing is he's going to give the what he believes is the appropriate amount of process, and but he's going to hold he's going to hold on time, and we're going to get a vote. That's what's, I think, believe that's what's going to happen. Uh, Elizabeth, can I ask you to go back? I think probably everyone in the room has either has or knows someone who has an Apple iPhone. So can you explain to us in a little more detail, because I know you had to go through it very quickly, what this antitrust question is in Apple, how it sorts out? Sure. It's, uh, you know, so it's the app store on your phone, right? You hit the icon, there are a bunch of apps there. Those apps are developed by someone. You know, it's usually some software coder, you know, creates the app. And then how, do, how does that coder get it to us? You know, Apple is providing, uh, you know, a medium there, like a platform. How do they, you know, reach us? So the issue in the case is Apple typically, you know, has some technical standards around, you know, what sort of apps it'll, it'll offer on its platform. And then it charges, uh, I think it's typically 30% of, you know, the cost of the app to the developer in order to make it available on the App Store for people to buy. And as I understand it, typically, not necessarily always, that 30% premium, as it were, for the app to be offered through the you know, Apple uh, you know, App Store is incorporated in the price of the app. So you know, the, the lawsuit was brought by end users, you and me, when we download the app saying, hey, you know, uh, Apple has like a monopoly on this App Store. And they're using their monopoly of this platform to charge this 30%. It's like a price gouging theory, right? And uh, you know, we'd rather not pay it. And so we are injured. We're paying too much for our apps. You know, if Apple wasn't monopolizing and using its monopoly this way, our apps would be cheaper. And so uh, you know, we want to bring uh, a Section 2 case. And the Clayton Act is the statute that enables you know the private damages uh, action on a Sherman Act violation. So fine. You know, the issue that comes up is the Illinois Brick Doctrine, because this was brought as a class action, as you can imagine, what are we paying for apps, you know, or 99 cents, right? So this is the classic, like, aggregation theory that, you know, this doesn't work unless you bring it as a class. Uh, and they say we should have standing to bring this suit under the antitrust laws because, you know, the developers won't. You know, they just pass on the cost, so they pay Apple the 30%, but they get it back from us. They have no reason to push this issue, but we're all over paying them, and monopoly, you know, abuse is going unchecked. The Illinois Brick Doctrine typically says you can't do that. You can, as a pass-through consumer or an indirect purchaser, bring one of these lawsuits. So it's a, you know, it, w it would, I think, be a typically a pretty straightforward application of that doctrine, but for the way this platform works, right? Because the issue is, as a consumer, you're actually interacting with the platform where they're saying the monopoly pricing is set. And so the argument's kind of devolving into like, who really sets the price? You know, Apple's view is, you guys are not the direct purchasers. You may buy off the platform, but the people who are purchasing are 
platform services are really the developer, they could choose not to, to pass this price on to you. You know, so we're selling to them. They're the direct purchaser. If they have a problem with it, they're the ones who can sue under the Illinois BRIC doctrine. You guys can't, and if you have issues, maybe take it up with them in some other avenue, but you can't come and bring a class action. It just doesn't work. And so this is the kind of classic intersection of like what we had in the credit card case, this new economy, electronic platforms, different paradigm for doing business, kind of colliding with these older doctrines. And you know, the court's got to confront how to, how to deal with this. I don't think it's particularly easy. All right. Well, unless there are any further questions, I will thank all the panel and the Federalist Society and wish you all a good day.